What is up guys? Welcome back to my channel. I'm so excited to be talking about today my experience at the Asbury Outpouring or the Asbury Revival, whatever you want to call it. I attended I think four days total and I'm just stoked for what the Lord did and is doing right now in our generation. Yeah. Just to preface this, like as I share my experience with you, the experience that I have there is that I've grown up in a Christian home all my life. I've grown up in church, in a Christian home. I've been in so many church services, so many services that were labeled revival. I've been, I've been at so many conferences. I've experienced so many different things throughout my life. I know I'm only 23, but I've experienced so many different church services just because like I said, I've grown up in church all my life. I have to say that this Asbury outpouring was unlike anything I've ever experienced before. Just being in that room with all of those people from all generations, especially seeing Gen Z and the young people leading it. What's really cool is that the last time that this happened, a move of God like this happened at Asbury was in February of 1970. And then shortly after the Jesus revolution, the Jesus people movement happened where so many young people were getting saved and brought to the Lord. And so now fast forward, it's February, 2023, and it's happening again at Asbury. And I'm praying that so many more countless young people come to know Jesus. I felt the Lord's manifest presence so strong in that room. It was unlike anything I've ever experienced before. And the really cool thing was that there was no smoke, lights, like really cool, colorful lighting, fog machines. There was no gimmicks. There was no big name speakers that were drawing people in. You know, it was estimated that over 50,000 people came through Asbury total during the whole span of it being open. So it started on February the 8th and I'm pretty sure that it either ended on February the 23rd or the 24th. And y'all, it just started on February 8th as a normal chapel service. And my understanding was a group of students just ended up staying over and they were confessing and repenting and worshiping and praying. And it just turned into a prayer meeting and it never stopped. It just kept going. And all of a sudden it blew up on social media and so many people came. People came from all over the world, all over the country. I know so many people drove from all over in the United States, all different states. I saw so many big name preachers, evangelists, people that are considered high profile preachers that were actually in the audience. And the really cool thing was, nobody, nobody acknowledged them. Nobody got up on stage and said, look, they're so-and-so and like publicly honored them. Now, do we need to honor our leaders? Yes, we need to honor our leaders and respect them and love them. But it was just cool to see that in that room, it wasn't those people big name speakers or leaders who was drawing people. It was Jesus. The focus was on Jesus. It, you could just tell the entire focus of the room was just on Jesus. Now, there was people that were observing. They were coming to observe what's going on. Like, I understand. You could just tell the central focus of the room was on Jesus and the Lord's presence was so strong. I remember that I didn't want to leave. Like, we were there for hours and hours. I can't even tell you how many hours we were there each day that we went, but it didn't seem like a normal church service where you could tell how much time is passing. I don't want to over exaggerate it, but it almost felt like heaven. It was just like unity and peace. It was like holy love and there was people being drawn to the altar. It was like the Holy Spirit was making the altar call. People were repenting, crying out to God, worshiping, prayer. There was deliverance happening. I saw a girl who started manifesting and my understanding is that she got delivered of a demon and there was, yeah, healing and salvation. There was preaching as well in those sermons. When I was there, the sermons that I heard were solid. They were from scripture. A lot of the preaching that they were doing, it was verse by verse, just straight scripture, which was so refreshing. It was so good. I was so impacted. I was impacted by some of the messages that they were preaching. I was impacted by just the presence of the Lord in the room. And the Lord really deeply moved in my heart and in my life. There was a lot of worship going on. It was mostly pretty much all worship. There was some preaching. Again, the messages that I heard were solid and there was prayer. 
radical humility, radical generosity. I literally saw this guy, this student on stage. He was an international student and he was testifying and in no way did he ask for money, but he opened up and shared how it's been really hard for him to get a job. And all of a sudden, somebody just threw money on the stage and then a swarm of people ran up and just started throwing money on the stage. The guy was like, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> it was so sweet, but... They just blessed him and blessed this student. And so it was so cool to see generosity. When I was there, they never took up an offering for anything that I saw, but it was just cool how people were just giving. I know people were donating stuff to Asbury and like snacks and water. There was miracles happening and they had students and young people share testimonies in front of the stage. That was really cool. And a lot of times what was happening during that, for example, this one person got up there and they testified that they were set free from depression and suicidal thoughts. Come on, so sorry, I'm getting like hyped, okay? But they were set free from depression and suicidal thoughts. And then all of a sudden when they said that, you know, people started praising the Lord. And then the person that was holding the mic basically asked across the room, they were like, does anyone Anyone else need freedom from depression and suicidal thoughts and so there's people that just popped up and stood up all over the room and they just said lay hands on them and we're gonna pray for freedom and so that was so cool to see that happen often where people would share testimonies of things they got set free from or sins or whatever and then they would allow people to take time if they want to stand up to say hey I'm struggling with this too and get prayer and get freedom so that was so cool to see there was a girl that was sitting next to me and it was crazy like this was the time where they actually they actually started separating closer to the end because there were so many young people and they wanted to prioritize the young people which I think is really cool because as I was talking to a friend he was talking about this about how the Lord is highlighting the younger generations to us and how we need to go after them you know when it started to get to the end they prioritized young people more so my parents were actually outside worshiping and they had like a si simul simulcast simulcast screen you guys know what I mean? Like one of those screens outside. They had like speakers outside. So my parents had to stay outside because the line was so long for them. And then I was able to get right in because I'm under 25. So I go in and it's Sunday and I'm sitting there. All of a sudden, like this girl comes in and she sits down next to me. The speaker says, you know, I want you guys to ask the person next to you, why are you here? Yeah, why are you here at Asbury? And then pray for each other. And so, you know, I turn to her, she turns to me, she asked me why I was here. And then I just go like, I, I say like, I know this is a cliche answer, but I'm here because of Jesus. And I was gonna explain more in my answer a little bit more because I figured that she might be a Christian. Then she like really thought my answer was cool. Without me even having to ask her, she immediately responds and she goes, I'm here because I'm an atheist and I heard about this going on and I've gone through some hard things in my life and I wanna know God. And I was so excited, like my jaw, I had to stop myself from my jaw dropping in that moment like, Oh my goodness, <laughs> it was so cool. I was like, wow, God, like this is so cool. And it was so cool to hear about just the atheists, the people that were getting saved. There were so many salvations in those weeks of this event going on. And I don't even like to call it an event, but there were so many salvations. People were asking if they made salvation calls. Yes, they made salvation calls. Yes, they talked about the gospel. And they were often calling people to purity and holiness before the Lord. They made space for confession. It was actually really cool because in, in the auditorium, it was super cool. Above the stage, it says holiness unto the Lord. And I just love that. And you'll see that in the videos that I'm going to be playing throughout this video. I love that. Like they were really focusing and emphasizing holiness and purity unto the Lord, which is so important. I believe when we are hungry for God, when we have pure hearts before the Lord, that's when he can really move. He knows motives. You know, we we may not have perfect theology. Yes, sound doctrine is so important. Everything in this move of God may have not been completely perfect, but I thought it was so cool that you could just tell there was a hunger in the room. There was focus on purity and holiness, and the Lord can use that powerfully for his glory when people are pure, when they are living pure behind the scenes, and when they're hungry for him. Like, we have to be hungry for God. If you don't have a hunger for God, why is he going to want to move in your life? Why is he going to want to move in your family, in your church? Like, you have to have a hunger 
and a thirst for God. And that's what I was seeing in this room is that these young people were just crying out to God and his manifest presence was so strong. And he was convicting people of sin and people were at the altars constantly repenting and crying out to God and confessing sin. I heard a testimony of a man there and he actually stood up and publicly confessed and repented of adultery, that he was committing adultery. Like, you can't tell me that that's not God for a man to stand up publicly and confess that he was committing adultery. My heart was personally so greatly impacted. I don't know how to explain it other than I have a greater passion and zeal for the Lord now. Literally, the first time I started sharing about Asbury, so I actually had to preach at my young adults group at my church the day I got back from Asbury for the first time. And I started sharing about Asbury and I literally started like tearing up so much. I couldn't help it. Like I was so greatly impacted at Asbury. Yeah, just a greater passion, greater zeal, greater fire for the Lord. I honestly, after Asbury, I feel broken in the best way. Just like a greater, deeper humility in my heart. The Lord was just cleansing me more and purifying me more. I feel more freedom in the Holy Spirit. I feel more encouraged. I feel more, again, I feel more free. Like God is so good. I noticed when I was in that room and I just kept my focus on Jesus, I had a powerful time with him. And I don't like to put the emphasis on encounter because I think it actually can be so unhealthy when we put our emphasis on encounter because there's a difference between pursuing Jesus and pursuing encounter. Pursuing encounter alone, I believe is not a pure motive. I've seen people pursue encounter and try to drum something up in their flesh and it actually leads to unhealthiness in their heart. There was a time in my life where I pursued encounter and I just wanted to have all these crazy encounters with God and encounters with Jesus are not bad y'all okay so hear me out on this but when you're solely pursuing encounter and and like I was at that time I actually started to struggle with self-condemnation because every time I wouldn't have this crazy encounter with God especially in the secret place I would condemn myself and think that something was wrong with me. And so it's not healthy to just pursue encounter. It is healthy to just pursue Jesus. And if he decides to radically encounter you, that's awesome. There's a big difference between pursuing encounter, which is not healthy, and pursuing Jesus, which is healthy. If you had a friend who is only friends with you for what they could gain from you, gaining influence from you and money and all of these things, and they didn't have a pure motive in being friends with you, like, would you actually want to be friends with that person? No, like, I wouldn't want to be friends with that person. That's not a real friend. That's not a true friend. My question is, why do we do that to God? Why do we pursue God just for his blessings and just for his encounters? And I have a question for you. If all of God's blessings, which are amazing, I'm thankful for God's blessings, but if all of them were taken away from you right now, and if he never had a a powerful encounter with you again. Would you still serve him? Would you still serve him? Honestly answer that because he is worthy to be served no matter what. You know, Jesus, what he did, he made a way on that cross for us to be reconciled to God. And that should be good enough for us. Yes, he still gives us peace and joy everlasting and all of these great things. But what he did on that cross was enough just so we could be reconciled to God. He is worthy of our lives laid down for him and even more than that. That's one reason I believe why God sovereignly moved in this place at Asbury. You know, I've been to so many revival services, services that were labeled revival, but a lot of them weren't actually true revival, I don't think. I think that we've got into this mindset of labeling everything revival when maybe it's not even true revival. When you look at revivals throughout church history, a lot of times they didn't label them revival until they could actually look back a while later and see that that revival, what was happening there, it impacted the region, the community, people around. It didn't just stay in the building, but it actually impacted the moral climate of the region around it. And we got to stop calling things revival if it's not impacting your city and the region around your church or community or whatever it is. So there is a difference between a genuine revival that impacts the moral climate and the community and the region around it versus an event or a church service that's labeled revival and it's just hyped up. And that's what I was so thankful to see at Asbury is that it wasn't just hyped up. It wasn't a bunch of hype. It wasn't people just trying to drum something up in their flesh. It was just worship unto the Lord. You know, the worship teams weren't super fancy. 
they were just singing their heart out to God and the Lord was moving and people were just worshiping and it was void of hype. And that's what we need so desperately. I believe that that can be the standard for our church services. We don't have to have dead and dry church services. If we will be pure before the Lord, if we will be hungry for him, and if we will actually be rooted in his word. That's what I really appreciated about the leaders too, is that you could tell the leaders that were speaking were rooted in truth and rooted in the scriptures. We need the Holy Spirit and we need the word of God. We need both. I believe what just happened is a part of what we've been praying for and contending for in Gen Z, for them to know God, for them to be hungry for God, for them to be delivered of suicide and depression and homosexuality. There was actually a girl at Asbury who got up and testified and said that she was set free from witchcraft and homosexuality and I so badly want to see that in this generation that this generation would be set free by the name by the blood of Jesus from witchcraft homosexuality suicide all of these things that this generation struggles with that they would be totally set free that they would give their lives to Jesus and that the gospel would go forth discipleship would actually be happening again people would be rooted in scripture in the word of God again we've been praying for a move of God and a genuine move of God not just a hyped up church service that's called revival but an actual revival where hearts are hungry and turning to the Lord you know I think revival can be such a buzzword I know that it's behind me I know this word revival is behind me but I believe it can be such a buzzword nowadays and the word revival is just slapped on everything but we need genuine revival where we don't have to call it revival in order for it to be revival but it's a genuine sovereign move of God where we don't hype something up we're just hungry we're just pure we just pray and fast for it we pray and fast for this generation and if God sovereignly moves that's awesome I would rather have a sovereign move of God than a church service that's hyped up and called revival any day (laughs) that's what I desire to see is just a sovereign move of the Lord where he just helps us and empowers us to go out and win our generation and he just sovereignly moves guys Don't let this stop at Asbury. I am encouraging you and myself. We need to go out and make disciples and preach the gospel like never before. The the gospel needs to be preached. The gospel needs to be preached. Don't hold it back. Souls are dying and going to hell and they need the gospel. And us Christians, we have to stop holding it back. The righteous are bold as a lion. Preach the gospel. And Lord, we just repent. I just want to say, Lord, we repent for any time. If you need to repent, repent. You know, I mean myself, I repent for any time where the Lord told me to go and preach the gospel to somebody. And I held it back because I thought it was going to be awkward. We can't worry about it being awkward. We have to preach the gospel and can't hold it back. This life is short. It's temporary. And people need to know that they can be reconciled to God, that they can live in true life in Jesus Christ. I'm praying that this sovereign move of God impacts cities, nations, the world. I pray that it continually impacts the world, cities, nations for the glory of God and that it doesn't just stop at Asbury, that it continues on. I pray that it impacts people for generations to come. And we need to pray for that. We need to keep going after the things that God told us to do. These things are normal for believers. They're supposed to be normal for believers for us to preach the gospel and make disciples. And if you are a solid believer and you are rooted in scripture, you should have disciples of your own and be relationally discipling people. That's how Jesus went about it. That's how the disciples, you know, Jesus made disciples and then those disciples went out and changed the world. We need to be making disciples church. Let's go. I'm so pumped. I'm so excited. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. And I just pray in Jesus name that it just continues. So guys, thank you for watching this video and just part of my testimony from being at Asbury. I am so encouraged. I feel more purified and just more free. So encouraged and encouraged to keep going after this generation for the glory of God. So guys, thank you for watching this video. I love you guys. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you attended Asbury to leave your thoughts in the comments below. And I've actually seen that it's starting to spread to other colleges and other colleges are having prayer meetings and worship and all of this stuff in response to what Asbury or what was happening at Asbury. So yeah, I love you guys. God bless you guys. And let's get this generation back to biblical truth, all for the glory of Jesus. Peace out. Thank you guys so much for watching my video. Make sure to check out my other videos over here and subscribe over there.